Good afternoon. I welcome Dr. Prem Bindraban to our CAES seminar series. Dr. Bindraban is from the IADC, which is headquartered in Alabama. He is currently the leader of a research and, and implementation program based in Ghana in West Africa that builds a private public relationship for the development of the fertilizer value chain and is aimed at improving food and nutrition security. He was formerly the executive, executive director of the VFRC, which was kind of a, a department of the IFDC based in Washington, DC. At, at that time, he was my supervisor. He was also director of ISRIC, which is the World Soil Information Center, and team leader of the natural resources at Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. He had been a researcher at, at CIMIT in Mexico and at IRI in the Philippines. He has developed university courses related to food security at Wageningen University and the University of Amsterdam, and he has taught theoretical production ecology for soil crop modeling at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. He has supervised numerous graduate students and published over 200 research and technical papers. Dr. Bindraban, the floor is now yours. Welcome. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm pleased that I can uh, be part of your virtual uh, meetings. Um, uh, uh, as Chris already said, we know each other quite some time. And um, uh, he moved on. Um, I stayed at IFDC, but in a different capacity. And I will um, talk to you about it. Um, one thing that we did also together with Jason White uh, and Chris is to uh, draft a paper on, let's say, the topic that I'll be talking about. <clears throat> it's about the need to come up with new innovative fertilizers um, so that we remain within what we call the safe operating space of our planetary boundary. Um, so let's go. Uh, buckle up. Uh, I have a lot to say, so I hope you can uh, uh, carry uh, continue and uh, stay interested. Just briefly, IFDC is International Fertilizer Development Center. We are a public uh, international uh, research and development organization, and we work uh, broadly on agricultural development and uh, food security. Um, we have about uh, um, a revenue of 55 million uh, a year, mostly coming from the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands Development uh, Agency, uh, USAID, um, and some other uh, smaller uh, donors. We, uh, we run some 25 projects in 20 nations. Uh, the dots that you see on the map are all countries that we have worked on in our 45 years of uh, existence. Actually, prior to IFDC, um, uh, the organization was um, the Tennessee Value Authority and uh, some 60% of the current fertilizers in the world were invented in uh, the Tennessee Value Authority, the predecessor of IFDC. So we operate world, worldwide. We have some um, uh, 60 international staff and most of our staff are in the country. Um, uh, we have um, about 80, 85% of our work on implementation and we still have some 10, 15% of our work on research, which is unique. Um, there are not so many organizations that have uh, strong implementation and with that even a research base. We do that. So what's our area of expertise? Um, we work on agriculture policies. Um, we help with capacity building, uh, with market development. Uh, the thing is, if you support farmers to grow more food, then uh, they should be able to sell it uh, somewhere. Um, we work, uh, we have, we are specialized in integrated soil fertility management in balanced fertilizers and in fertilizer research and development. But as I said, those are not the only areas we work in. Um, it's all embedded in overall agriculture development along the whole value chain. Let me uh, introduce briefly the program I'm currently coordinating, uh, Fertilizer Research and Responsible Implementation in, uh, in Ghana. And as you can see, we work with a lot of institutions in the world, um, in the Netherlands, in Morocco, in Belgium, and uh, several uh, Ghanaian institutions, including the ministries uh, in Ghana, which is essential to have impact. Basically, what we want is a, a fertilizer sector transformation, and um, that should drive sustainable agriculture intensification for improving food and nutrition security. And our entry point is actually location-specific fertilizers, location and crop-specific specific fertilizers. So that's the, the broad uh, idea. 
Um, here you see that we are uh, experimenting. These are the dots are the areas where we are having trials with rice, maize and soybean. And um, uh, it's a unique program. Um, I left, let's say, Wageningen University uh, for IFDC. And the reason is that I thought that with universities, we did not have enough impact in the world. Um, I couldn't tell my parents or brothers and sisters, you see these people in Ghana or in Indonesia, they improved their agriculture because of our research. Um, so I moved on to IFTC because IFTC works on implementation with farmers. But the problem is with NGOs that they uh, might introduce techniques and technologies that would not have sufficient evidence base. So in this program, we have a pillar where we will work with universities and we will have PhDs and postdocs working on soil science, on uh, fertilizer uh, production engineering, on agronomic aspects, on the economics, uh, not at the farm, just at the farm level, but also everybody who's involved in the value chain and on um, social aspects. If you want that farmers use a certain fertilizer product, then somebody should produce it, somebody should sell it, and everybody in the chain should actually earn a living. So how do you align all these people and how do you make them all make a living out of it? Um, as I said, we are also an NGO, so we are working on the ground with people uh, to set up a platform uh, to do all our trials and research. And um, these are, it's a complicated diagram now, but these are some of the actual uh, activities that we are conducting. So for instance, here below, you will see a multi-stakeholder platform. So we are creating, let's say, a platform for all these people to talk together how to solve uh, any problem that they face in the value chain. So this is just an example. We are conducting on station trials. We are conducting on farm trials um, and we link to the Ghana Extension uh, Research and Extension Network in reaching out to farmers and into in disseminating our findings. Um, we did, for instance, a baseline survey to understand the current food insecurity situation, the poverty situation, the yield levels of the farmers, etc. Because um, uh, that will, of course, drive what we will be, uh, what kind of actions we will be taking. Uh, taking. Um, so we go out in the field, we take measurements, we even cut, we take uh, uh, yield cuts um, to uh, to find out what the yields are um, at the farm level. This is the example, as I said, on the on the multi-stakeholder platform. So we did a whole study and we draft policy briefs because having a research paper is nice, but policymakers won't read it. So we also turn those things into policy briefs. Um, we conducted um, a survey uh, to understand the stakeholder dynamics in the Ghanaian uh, fertilizer value chain. And with that, we are preparing, let's say, how a multi-stakeholder platform could look like. So that's the kind of work that we are doing um, um, and um, in which we try to combine research, science uh, with implementation to have the uh, largest impact. OK, um, let's go to the talk of today. Actually, um, the whole context in which all this is happening. Um, uh, and I will start off with the whole global context. Um, <clears throat> what we have done over the past decades, let's say since the Second World War, we have been increasing the yields of our crops while uh, the acreage uh, remained fairly constant. We haven't taken a lot more land into cultivation to produce more food. We produced more because of higher yields per hectare. And that went, for instance, hand in hand with increasing use of fertilizers. Uh, this is nitrogen in this case, um, um, which means that on the one hand, currently fertilizers contribute to almost uh, half of the world's food that's being produced. Um, with that, because we didn't need more land, we helped to save almost a billion hectares of land over the past couple of decades. But on the other hand, we do have eutrophication problems. We have dead zones and we have emissions of greenhouse gases also from fertilizer use uh, uh, in the fields. So um, um, it's all not that shiny. Um, we have these favorable impacts, but we also have these downsides. Now, the fertilizer industry would, of course, claim um, uh, the fact that we have to produce more food means that we will need more fertilizers. Well, um, I think we should uh, turn the tides 
and uh, we should turn the corner and we should basically do more with less and we should um, be able to um, produce more food but with smarter fertilizers and use less of that. Um, these are the dead zones. Uh, the amount is, uh, is, is increasing. This is an example in, uh, well, um, uh, down south in the Gulf of Mexico, where you end up having hypoxic areas um, causing all these um, uh, environmental problems. Just as an example. Now, what do we see in the world? Um, we apply a lot of fertilizers in different parts of the world, in Europe, uh, in the US, uh, uh, China. Um, but on the other hand, we do not apply enough fertilizers, let's say on the African continent. You can see the uh, yellowish reddish parts are negative, meaning that we are depleting the soil on this continent. The magnitude that we are talking about is huge. If we would, um, um, if we would optimize the use of nitrogen in China, these are numbers of a couple of years ago already, we could produce the same amount of food with 11 million tons of uh, nitrogen less. Now, if you would apply all that nitrogen on the 174 million hectares of arable land on the African continent, you could apply up to 70 kilograms of nitrogen. So we are talking big numbers in terms of excessive use and in terms of uh, deficiencies if it comes to the fertilizers. So we have the green revolutions, but we also have environmental problems and we have degradation issues. So we really have to revisit our fertilizers. Now, this is a very interesting concept, the plant reboundaries. Um, uh, I think it's intriguing because it connects different drivers in the world. Basically, what this concept says is that we have various drivers um, um, that, um, let's say, uh, change the biology and the ecology of Earth. Um, it's about uh, the Holocene relative to the Anthropocene. Let's say since the last ice age, some 11,000 years ago, uh, the world has been changing due, due to, to our uh, in, human interventions. Now, one of the um, drivers uh, of planetary change are fertilizers, the nitrogen and the phosphorus uh, cycles, but also climate change, biodiversity loss, land use change, uh, fresh water use, uh, and we have all these drivers, um, atmospheric and oceanic. Now, um, this group has calculated, estimated more or less, you could say, the limits of uh, exceeding the what they call the planetary boundary. And these are some estimates, a lot of criticism, a lot of discussion, but I think the, the main point is um, that these are also interconnected. In terms of nitrogen, we have by far exceeded our limits. In terms of phosphorus, we are close to it. We have lost already too much biodiversity, changing climate. So uh, this concept basically tells us um, we really have to push back some of these, um, these drivers. And if it comes to fertilizers, if we would be able to push back the use of nitrogen, um, at the same time, increase the yields per hectare, we would prevent, let's say, land use change. And with that loss of biodiversity, we could reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. So you see all these drivers are interlinked, whereby fertilizers really play a critical role. So um, in that sense, fertilizers is not a small thing. It has impact on all life on Earth, you could say. So we did some calculations um, we, uh, and into some more detail. If this would be the planetary boundary, the 100%, um, whoops, then um, uh, when we look at the amount of phosphorus flowing into the oceans, um, today, it, as I just said, we are just below that boundary, but in 2050, we would exceed it if we continue with business as usual. Um, we could also prevent 50% of our food loss. We could um, eat half less animal-based products, um, we could increase the feed conversion, con, uh, conversion. So these are all measures that we could take and try and see what happens. As you can see, uh, reducing our meat consumption would have an impact on the amount of phosphorus needed and uh, therefore the amount of phosphorus flowing into the ocean. Um, this is the radi radiator forcing. Um, this is the required land area. And here we have the total nitrogen loss. You see nitrogen already exceeded the limits and it will just go out of whack, as you can see, um, 
animal uh, uh, consumption may depress it a bit, but nothing will bring it back into, let's say, the safe operating space. If we take all measures, all these measures, that's only when we could have um, some favorable conditions, uh, but still nitrogen would be an issue, but it's very unlikely that we would be able to do all of this together. So basically the message here is that our cur current fertilizer products, they would be unable to push us back into the safe operating space of our planet. So if we carry on with these products, even if we would be able to reduce fertilization losses by 50%, if we would lose the leaching losses of nitrogen and phosphorus by 50%, still with the current products, we would not be able to be in this safe operating space. Um, now, the other side of the coin is, let's say, the African continent. Um, these are maize yields in Europe um, over the past few decades, uh, from the 60s to, let's say, uh, 2000s. The yield has gone up a lot in Europe, and we hardly used more land, and with that produced a lot more food. This is um, Western Africa. What you see is that the yields hardly increased, but they use a lot more land. Um, so they got more food, but at the expense of land. And that's a real problem. When you look at the availability of food per person, um, it has actually decreased over the past decade on the African continent. The population is exploding, we have about a billion now in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, on the African continent. It will be 2 billion in uh, 2050, and it will be 3 to 4 billion in 2100. Those are huge numbers. So uh, in addition to that, we have changing climate. As you can see, the conditions may, be get, may get drier, which will have an impact on, um, uh, of course, on productivity. And we already see signs of, let's say, people moving out of areas where the natural assets are really depressing. This is an example uh, with increasing uh, temperature change, um, model estimates um, that we will have an, an issue with, let's say, maintaining our yields. Um, so the increasing temperature will depress our yields. Same thing over time uh, from 2020 onwards, you will see that the uh, uh, yield changes may um, well have a quite negative impact on what we need to achieve. And we have to feed even more people on that continent. Already, uh, Africa is facing, let's say, a decline due to climate change. Uh, this is relative to the industrial, pre-industrial climate. You can see that the yields have already gone down by some 10 to 20% relative to, let's say, the climate of uh, uh, before the industrial uh, revolution. Um, so that's quite a challenge. And the question is, we have all these pressures on biodiversity with all these people on air, land, water, with our fertilizers. How much further can we squeeze our earth um, before it collapses? Which means that we really have to take action to make things uh, work and change. Now, you would think this would be um, concern for, um, for urgency, um, people to really move on. But when we look at the spending in the industry, um, when you look at pharmaceutical and seed industry, they will spend about 16 to 20 percent of their revenues back into research and development to come up with new products, with new medicine, medication, etc. Well, we know all about it these days. When you look at the breeding sector, they will also spend some 10, sometimes even 20, 25 percent uh, in the vegetable uh, breeding of their revenues into research and development. But when you look at the fertilizer industry, it's very scary. Fertilizer industry hardly invests in innovative and new technology. The money they would spend is on, say, on demonstration. Um, I'm sure when you uh, ride along uh, the long roads in the US, you will see all these signs of certain products being tested. That's about it. Um, there are some small innovative companies, some specialty fertilizers, some biostimulants, some organic fertilizers, but in relative amounts, that's just nothing. I should say there seems to be some changes in the uh, mindset emerging, but still we are, we are not uh, near where we should be. So the fertilizer industry is, uh, is really something to look after. Now, what, what will they do? Basically, they will push for the 4R nutrient stewardship. This is very typical in the US, for instance, to use the right fertilizer at the right time, right amount, right place. You know, we know this thing for decades. 
if I have my plant standing on place A, I would not put my fertilizer on, on, on place B. Um, um, so this has been applied, let's say, in Europe since the mid 80s, when government policy really imposed the reduction of losses from uh, fertilizers, and we still are struggling and having a problem. Um, in Europe, so they have advanced uh, from not just being more efficient, but also to recycle uh, the nutrients. So in that sense, Europe is trying to take a second step, and um, that's now called the circular economy. I'm also a little bit critical here because you see the thing is this looks like end of pipeline solution. Once you have messed up, you kind of create the economy to clean it up. So you will end up with a self-fulfilling prophecy to make a lot of waste because that has become an economic uh, activity in itself. Anyway, the world is struggling how to deal with these things. Now, if it comes to these fertilizers, um, I already said they helped us to increase yield. We produce more than half, half or more than half of our food due to fertilizers, but we run into eutrophication, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, on the other hand, it saved a lot of land. But we see a lot of soil nutrient mining and erosion on the African continent, decline in organic matter, loss of biodiversity because of all these new lands that has to be taken into cultivation. Um, so that's another downside of the whole story. So it relates to poverty. It relates, therefore, to the Sustainable Development Goal 1. So fertilizers have a role to play in poverty reduction. They have a role to play in zero hunger. They have a role to play in clean water and sanitation, in life on land, life uh, below water even. Uh, they have a role to play in climate actions. They have a role to play in industrial innovations, in responsible consumption and production, as I said, um, eating less meat, for instance. Um, it's meant for economic growth and development as well. Um, good health and well-being. So basically fertilizers are all over the place and people don't realize it. So we tend to kind of work on this chemical stuff, uh, see how the crop responds and that's about it. But if you look at it from a global perspective, fertilizers have a fantastic role and are um, yeah, quite a severe driver of our global change. And I think we really have to act on that. Let's see. Um, which means that I think we should really move towards what I would call a transformation of the fertilizer sector. Um, and um, also together with Jason and with Christian, we came up with a paper on innovative fertilizer and application technologies. What is this animal, this industry? It's a huge industry. Uh, we produce about 500 million tons of fertilizers. Um, it has a market value of about $200 billion. It's several times bigger than the seed industry. So this is an oil tanker that is really difficult to kind of change course. Um, and you have a couple of big players. Actually, they are even merging. These are two Canadians. These are the biggest uh, player in the world. They become even stronger, which means that you end up with very powerful entities uh, difficult to move. And there are very many mergers going on right now. There's also quite some um, concerns, therefore, for instance, this paper talks about uh, putting it mildly, basically, uh, you can read this phrase later, um, basically saying that with, with more competition, the prices would go down. Um, not to say that there is monopoly or uh, oligopoly, but uh, there tends to be some issues on, um, let's say, the free market concerns. And um, there are calls here and there also um, to have a, a, a proper examination of what the fertilizer industry is actually doing in the world. Um, so we have, we have an issue. We need the fertilizers. We can't do without to produce our food, but we do need to change in terms of their efficiency and the losses they, uh, the, the environmental challenges they, uh, they create. Now, why don't we have all these drivers? Why, why isn't it taking off? Why isn't it that there is a lot of pressure? Well, the thing is, fertilizers are needed for food production. So some people will also relate it to positive things. You know, it's good for our golf courts, etc. So what's the issue? Um, but we have all these environmental and social so shortcomings. Um, 
uh, they have they are fundamental uh, uh, have a fundamental impact on all life on earth as i tried to explain but there is little societal awareness probably some of you also in this in this conference haven't given fertilizers this global thought itself while you are working uh, in the scientific field of it so there's little societal awareness and with that little pressure for change um, which makes that the fertilizer industry can actually continue to remain relatively conservative. I don't want to be negative against the industry. We need the industry, we need the fertilizers, but we really need, let's say, a transformation of this, of this sector. So we need to come up with innovative fertilizers, but it will not just be a technical solution. Um, it has to be embedded in societal and political and industrial systems because this animal is really huge. It's a big thing. Um, so it, it really calls for a, a, a change in the trends that we have in agricultural development. I hope all this makes sense and that you are still with me. Um, please not, not that I can see you, but I hope it, it does. So what is it that we are proposing? We are proposing actually a, a reversal of the fertilizer design. Um, what we have, chemists and industrial processing engineers, they will develop a fertilizer product. We dump it on the soil uh, and we expect the biology to do something with it. That's a bit awkward, isn't it? Um, uh, what we actually need is to understand the, the plant physiological, the metabolical, the transport processes of the plants, and those should be guiding us how to produce my fertilizer uh, and how to apply it to the farmer, uh, sorry, to the, uh, to the plant. So if I need zinc, I won't be given zinc acid, I hope, uh, because some chemical in engineer thought of a zinc acid, but it has to fit my human metabolism. So we will package the sink in a way that it fits my biology. We don't do it with the fertilizers. It doesn't fit the plant's biology, the uptake mechanisms, transport mechanisms, etc. So we looked into these things in, in, in well, from, from the plant physiological perspectives. Let's say a paper we wrote with, wrote with Christians is that nutrients uh, definitely enter through the roots, but some can also be applied through, um, through the leaves. What I am saying, um, like myself, if I end up in a hospital, um, if they put an infusion in me to get some med medication or what have you in my body, if I could um, um, hang an infusion in a fruit tree with nutrients, I would do it. So um, uh, entering uh, nutrients through the roots is one avenue, but we should try and look into all the biology of the plant to come up with fertilizer products that might, might be effective. So this is the paradigm shift that we are proposing in the fertilizer design. Right now we have a very bulky chemical industry. This takes billions of dollars to open up a mine, let's say for our phosphorus or to produce our nitrogen fertilizers. We end up producing almost all of our fertilizers in the world are NPKs. Um, we apply it as good as possible according to these principles on our field and we hope the biology will do something with it. What we propose is to turn it around. Don't mind all the wordings, it's just about the concept. We should start, let's say, from the plant metabolic processes, from the nutrient uptake, from societal objectives even, and I will get back to that. And those should be driving how to design and how to apply my fertilizers to the plant. And we may end up for instance, these are nanoparticles in the cell. So this is where these two worlds may meet, where you have the nutrients that we somehow end up uh, processing, producing in a different way and being applied to the plants in a different way with, uh, that would be a lot more uh, effective. And I'll give an example of that. So this is, let's say, the concept that we are proposing, the integrated, uh, the innovative fertilizer and application technology. Um, a couple of examples. This is work from your institute, from Jason, Jason White itself. For instance, um, we, I, I just mentioned in the previous slide, most of our fertilizers are NPK. But when you look at it closely, then micronutrients can help, for instance, with, with increasing the tolerance to diseases, uh, um, for instance. Um, we know from uh, micronutrients um, that they can increase the nutritional content in the grains. And I will 
show in a minute why that would be important. Um, um, let me see. So um, we see, for instance, uh, if we have a situation where we impose drought on a crop, you will see uh, a depression in this case in the micronutrient content, for instance. But when we add the micronutrients into the solution, we can revive that loss because of drought um, and be back, let's say, to our older uh, levels. Um, so basically saying that we can recover our micronutrients even under drought uh, um, conditions. Um, we have seen that micronutrients can mitigate the reduction of the NPK uptake as well. They can mitigate even the yield reduction. In the same experiment, we see that um, under drought, our yields would collapse almost by half, but that by adding micronutrients under the dry conditions, one third of that yield reduction would be um, make up, made up again. So the reduction would be less. Uh, and as I, as I said, these micronutrients can enhance plant res uh, resistance uh, and diseases. So there are a, there's a lot more to it if we are smarter with our the combinations of the nutrients that we use. This is a work we did with the students on post-harvest quality. We added calcium, um, boron, and calcium and boron relative to water on cucumbers. This is the storage day and the firmness of, um, of the cucumber. And under uh, the, the water conditions, you will see that the firmness would collapse uh, quickly and would be lower than when we treat the cucumbers with uh, these uh, these elements. Um, this is the the glucose um, content. Um, this is carbohydrates, and what we see is that under the applications of these nutrients, boron and calcium, uh, there is a higher carbohydrate content relative to let's say water. Basically, what what this tells us that we can store our um, um, cucumber for a much longer period of time and with that reduce our food waste, for instance. So what does it mean? It means that fertilizers are not just a commodity, a big bag of fertilizers that we sell uh, to increase yields. That's, that's it. Yeah, we need it for yields and with that to work on societal problems of uh, hunger and uh, out-migration of people, for instance. But we also know that if we are smarter, we can um, increase the uptake efficiency and with that reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and losses uh, to, um, to water. We can increase the nutritional content of our food items and with that work on hidden hunger. I will demonstrate that in a minute. Um, we can work on the plant health, as I said, so we might need, let's say, less pesticide if my plant is a lot more um, uh, tolerant to, uh, to diseases. Um, by increasing the biomass, we can put it back into the ground, into the soil, and improve our soil health and sequester carbon, for instance. And la last but not least, with recycling, we could increase our resource use efficiency and contribute to a circular economy if we get our nutrients back into the system. So the point that I want to make is that fertilizers are not just a commodity, they are actually a public good a public good in the sense that if we are able to help produce healthier food items, people may get less ill, end up less in a hospital, and with that we could save on healthcare costs. So it becomes not just a commodity, uh, but something that contributes um, to reduce cost in healthcare and to increase the human uh, well-being. So it becomes a public good in that sense. So if we open up and if you look at it from its wider perspective, it would make a lot more sense um, to work on increasing the efficiency and see even whether a Ministry of Health, for instance, would be interested in investing in innovative fertilizers. Um, let me give an example. Um, I still have some time, right? Are you still with me? People are still following? Chris, are you with me? Yes, we are here. OK, good. OK, so let me carry on on uh, on plant fertilization and human health. OK, just to just to make this a little bit more lively. What we have seen over the past few um, uh, decades, actually, since the Second World War, I indicated that we increased our yields, which is great. So we had more food, 
But as you can see, we also collapsed the micronutrient content in our grains. Um, this is true for, uh, for wheat, it's true for maize, it's true for rice, it's even true for uh, fruits and vegetables. And the reason why this collapsed could be several. One of it, we have been breeding for our wheats and maize to give a higher yield, but we didn't look in, into the nutritional content. So when you look at the, these varieties that have been released over, the, over these decades, you will see that the iron and, and zinc concentration actually has been going down over time. We just didn't pay attention to it, okay? Um, also, when you look at the soils, uh, this is an example. If we grow our crops year in, year out, every decade with only NPK, we end up depleting our soils for, let's say, available sink. So here you would see that over all these crops, all these seasons, over time, and this is over 23 years and 70 crops in uh, uh, Bihar in India, that the um, uh, soil sink has been decreasing over those decades. Now, if I would have done a trial 30 years ago, I would not have seen an impact of sink on my yield because of the high sink availability. I do a treatment, sink treatment now, I would probably see a yield response. So we think that this decline in nutritional content has been due to breeding, but also due to the fact that we actually undernourished our plants. Okay, there's another argument, by the way, due to increasing carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere, our plants grew faster. So they also, uh, that also might have helped to dilute all these uh, micronutrients. So basically what we are saying, if we have kind of turned our food to be even less um, uh, healthy, um, why not through agronomic fortification? Um, this is a zinc deficient rice. This is a child with zinc deficiency. Why not try to enhance the zinc concentration and to work on human health? This is an example of um, uh, human zinc deficiencies in the world. Um, it's high in the reddish area. And these are the soils with um, uh, uh, limited zinc availability. And you kind of see the similarities um, between these uh, these uh, locations. So um, this is just an example where we could try with sink and see where, what contribution we could make. But life unfortunately was not meant to be easy. So let me take you a step ahead. One of the problems in our food, it's not a problem, but is phytate. Phytate is a storage organ uh, of um, uh, phosphorus. Um, uh, of course, uh, phytate is not all that bad. Let me see, do I have that slide? Yeah, it has positive health effects. It's anti-carcinogenic, it's a strong antioxidant, uh, and it, it helps with our kidney um, uh, health. But um, phytate, unfortunately, also has this habit of fixing, for instance, iron and zinc and calcium uh, B-phalent um, uh, um, ions. So, while doing so, unfortunately, um, when I would eat the grain with a lot of phytate that has captured my zinc and my iron, that zinc and iron would not be bioavailable to my body. So I can try to increase my zinc in my grain, but if it has a lot of phytate, it will still not be available uh, to me um, for my health. So uh, this is, um, let's say the concentration of phytate relative to uh, zinc. If the ratio of phytate to zinc is less than five, I would take up 50% of the zinc. If that ratio is, let's say, higher than 15, it would just be 15% of the zinc that I would take up. Now look at this African continent, the phytate to zinc ratio. The darker areas are 30 and higher. So even if you would increase the zinc concentration, just a tiny amount of that would be taken up um, in these areas. And this is the dietary phytate and zinc concentration. So one of the things to do is to increase my zinc, but actually also to reduce my phytate. Um, and this is one of the challenges we have. This is the impact of phosphorus on uh, zinc and, uh, and iron uptake. Um, when we apply phosphorus, 
it increases my phosphorus concentration, my content or the uptake, sorry, but also my phytate goes up. And unfortunately, it also depresses my zinc uptake and a little bit not significant, but also my iron. And with that, it worsens my phytate to zinc ratio, which is a bad thing. That's not what I wanted. So if we apply a lot of phosphorus to our soils, and we tend to do that excessively because the phosphorus is captured by, uh, uh, by soil particles um, and organic matter, etc., cetera, uh, oxides, um, we tend to over apply our phosphorus and we might end up causing all these problems. Um, but when you look at it, we don't need so much phosphorus at all. If it's about photosynthesis, we just need a tiny amount of phosphorus. It's actually nitrogen in the leaves that drives photosynthesis. Also, when you look at yields, basically what we see at a certain concentration of phosphorus in the grains, you will not have an increase in yield anymore. So then it's, it's done and all this phosphorus over here is uh, captured as phytate uh, in the vacuoles and with that it causes all these troubles. So we don't need all that much phosphorus to have a high yield. Um, this is another uh, issue also um, uh, with, with the impact of zinc on, uh, on phosphorus. They tend to be uh, kind of antagonistic, they interact. Um, and you, if you add your zinc, it also depresses your phosphorus. So we have an issue with both of these um, uh, nutrients together. Um, why are these micronutrients important? And when you look at the yields, let's say on the African continent, we see that if you add micronutrients uh, on the African continent, we tend to do better, okay? Even with less fertilizers, we might end up having uh, some higher yields. Um, it could be that the African continent is older, it's more weathered, and the soils have um, are actually poorer also in terms of micronutrients. So what is the strategy? The, then the fertilizer strategy is to work on food security, but also on nutritional security to have a product that is healthier, to work on soil health, environmental health. Um, that would mean that we need outputs of a high yield, low phytate, high zinc, for instance, low nutrient losses. That again tells us that we may need to look into how to apply our P, zinc and iron smartly. We could do that, for instance, foliarly. It means that we may have to uh, apply uh, nanoparticles uh, or, or, or uh, organic acids, um, polyphosphates. Um, uh, we could also look into the soil application. We could think of coating our seeds. Um, again, applying uh, uh, rock phosphate together with, let's say, acidifying uh, phosphorus. So we have different approaches how to actually um, manipulate uh, the growth of our plant um, to have a high phosphorus uh, photosynthesis to high uh, rooting um, in early stages, etc. So um, by thinking smartly, we can come up with a different product and application strategy to work on these um, on these issues. Now, one of the implications is, for instance, for the fertilizer industry, because we are talking about the transformation process. Currently, what we do, we dig up our, our um, um, phosphorus, rock phosphate from our uh, mines. We add some acids to it. We turn it into water soluble phosphorus. We end up with some phosphorus gypsum that causes environmental problems. And the stupid thing is that this water soluble phosphorus we apply it to our soils and it's all captured by the soil. And we are lucky if part of it ends up in the plant. Now, by the philosophy that we applied, you can come up with a whole array, a whole range of other avenues that to deal with, let's say, this whole situation. For instance, um, you could grind or, or chemically process into nanoparticles, and this could even be the rock phosphate. You can apply it to the soil, um, but we could also, um, some of these, maybe even directly apply it to the plant through foliar applications. So basically the philosophy opens up a lot of other avenues also from the industry, what to produce and how we apply it to the plant. Um, so here we go. Um, this, this kind of is, is the philosophy. Um, it may sound very complicated, 
but if we can work on, let's say, improving human health, and if we would be able to convince our Ministry of Health to also invest in these kind of things, it would become a, a topic that is that goes beyond just the concern of the industry. It would be a concern of uh, the whole of society. So here we go. Um, our innovative fertilizer and application technology is not just a tiny thing. It would actually contribute to all these development uh, goals. And if we are able to um, kind of uh, raise that dialogue, if we are able to convince our world banks, our government that this is bigger than just nutrients and it's bigger than just something that only pollutes and gives us only high yields, uh, I hope we will be able to kind of push this uh, transformation um, of the fertilizer industry for a lot more benefits for our society. So that's um, um, all folks for today. And I hope it made sense what I said. Um, it took me 43 minutes, I see. Thank you. Okay, thank you Prem for the very excellent presentation. Uh, I'm looking at the questions here. I have um, um, a few questions here. Uh, let me ask my own question first. <laughs> so speaking about the concept of planetary boundaries, um, what? how would you say that reflects to a place like Africa where fertilizer use efficiency is very low? How does it play in Africa, for instance? Well, um, still the concept would apply. For instance, one of the problems is that because of uh, the use of uh, too little fertilizers, we end up mining the soils. OK, if you apply just five kilograms of nitrogen, you know, your maize already uh, one ton of maize already takes up. What is it? 15, 20 kilograms of nitrogen. So we deplete our soils. What happens and we see that actually happening that yields on the continent uh, um, on many places even going down, farmers go out and cultivate more land. And with that, um, you um, um, have to um, you, you end up losing biodiversity, which is one of the other drivers of the planetary boundaries. You um, end up losing your soil organic matter, which is again another driver of the planetary boundaries. So the planetary boundaries um, basically tells us that all these drivers are interconnected. So for the African continent, it basically means that we would need to use more fertilizers, but not more of this old stuff that has these negative impacts. But if we can leapfrog development of the African continent with innovative fertilizers, that would be the way to go. OK, thanks. There's a question from from Jason here. It says, um, how do agrochemical companies react to the to the concept of planetary boundaries and their, um, with relation to their current products? Yeah. Well, um, that's a bit of a challenge. Um, um, we have some insight uh, uh, into the industry, um, but one of the first reactions is actually, you know, whoa, um, hold on here. Um, it's actually to um, start raising questions like um, who has defined the boundary? Who says the boundary uh, could not be, let's say, uh, higher or lower, etc. cetera. Um, so what happens is that they will move into discussing uncertainties around these concepts. Um, that's the first reaction. Um, a second reaction um, that I see, I mentioned that uh, very slowly, there are some companies that are kind of inclined to think, you know, we must do something with it. But you can imagine that this change process will be very long. If I have invested $200 million in a factory to produce nitrogen, that uh, is a lot of capital that went that got into it. So all that sunken capital has to be earned back. So you rather sell as much nitrogen as possible to make up for your money. Um, so which makes it difficult to turn, let's say, the course of these uh, oil tankers, um, which means that we have to really set up a dialogue with the industry and uh, not just with the industry, but also with policy, with society, to, uh, to, turn, uh, to turn the corner. Um, so how do they respond? Well, um, I think on the one hand, um, defensive, um, unfortunately, and unfortunately also not reaping the opportunity and saying, look people, this is not just a problem of the industry, this has become a societal problem and let's work on it as a society. Let, let me just illustrate. Unilever, for instance, 
one of these um, um, multinational uh, food companies, they did it very smartly. There was a lot of NGO criticism on Unilever. Basically, they embraced their criticism and they listened to them, they talked to them, they set up um, global platforms of dialogues. And then it turns out that the problem is very, very complicated and that the steps to be taken to change the course is, uh, these are just small steps, but taken together. And then you see society kind of comes in and helps the industry also in making those changes. So I think industry would could be smarter and uh, turn this into an opportunity. All right, thanks. Another question from Jason. Um, he says uh, there are many groups of um, researchers developing plants that are more tolerant to poor conditions, including nutrient poor soils. Example, um, uh, uh, plant breeding, genetics, genetic, genetic modification, and external amendments like nanomaterials uh, um, such as cerium. Uh, the question is, do you see real potential with this approach or is it just interesting research? Um, well, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, I have this program in Ghana where I try to kind of uh, jump all these steps and we are trying some new things in our field already. So not just in the laboratory and in the greenhouses, but we are trying some stuff in, in the field. Um, so I think first would be to see whether we could do those, um, um, take those big steps. Um, is it only research? Well, it will be only research if we don't really push it into, uh, into implementation. But we should also think critically what we are doing. So if I have a, a crop that is um, more efficient, let's say in uh, taking up nutrients, then definitely it might, let's say, uh, exc uh, excrete exudates to help dissolve the nutrients and take it up. But if we don't put that nutrient back into the soil, these crops which will actually deplete the soils even more. So we really have to think of a smarter way of combining things. You see, you have breeding working on increased sink concentrations in, in grains, for instance, which is nice. So genetically, it might be interesting, but in the end, the sink should come from the soil or from the foliar application. So you have to think of these different dimensions uh, together. So um, I am a person, I am very much in favor of research. Human ingenuity has brought us a lot of good things. A human ingenuity will also help us to overcome COVID. Um, so I do think, I do believe uh, that we need that ingenuity, but we have to be a lot smarter in how we apply it because too much research just stays uh, where it is. And for me, it was the reason to go to IFTC. Um, so we should think of smart modes of taking some bigger steps towards implementation. Uh, just to add a little bit of uh, to what Prem has said, um, you can't give what you don't. What, you can't get what you don't give. If you don't apply the fertilizer, you, even if your 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 crop is uh, very superior in genetics, it uh, you, won't, you won't get anything back. So uh, one one question from Kitty says here: um, um, At what at at what time or when do we um, consider uh, utilizing urine and human manure um, as fertilizers? Yeah. Um, well. Um, what I just mentioned, Europe is kind of um, uh, taking, trying to take a next step, which is uh, recycling of nutrients. So all this stuff come into play. Um, uh, so one of the things that is being done indeed is extracting um, nutrients also from manure, for instance. Uh, lots of experiments also in the Netherlands on human waste uh, feces and on urine. Another interesting example was, for instance, in Bangladesh where you can use human urine and animal urine to put it on charcoal. So the charcoal absorbs all this and you use the charcoal to amend your soil and it, it seems to work. Um, so uh, my answer is basically, look, um, all the nutrients that we, that we lose to the environment, we should try to recapture. Um, but that is still an end of the pipeline solution. So we should work on the front end to try to reduce the losses through, let's say, this type of innovative approaches with high uptake efficiencies. Um, and, and so the first thing is to close the tap of our waste. But once we have the waste, we should indeed try to recycle it. And whether it's feasible, well, that's again, this economic story. 
and it's also how we value our environmental damage. So um, that's why I said we, we need a broader societal discussion about the value of nutrients. All right, I have another question for myself. Um, uh, would you say it would be OK to set the planetary boundaries differently for different continents, given that we have uh, different user efficiencies? We're not at the same place yet. Yeah, and those studies are being done. So there are studies that look specifically into Europe or into other continents. Uh, I know that and you could say, well, um, it is, the situation would be different. At least the, the actions would be different in Europe compared to uh, um, uh, the African continent, for instance. So yeah, I agree. Uh, you would end up having uh, different um, um, drivers, let's say, for change uh, if it comes to that. Yeah, fully agree. Okay. Um, one question from from Jason. He says, um, Singapore has a large effort to grow more of their food instead of importing them because there is very little land available. They are looking at things like rooftop hydroponics, and the USDA um, also has a very in interesting. Um, they have they are interested in urban agriculture, which includes um, controlled environmental agriculture. Do you see this type of approach as playing a big role in the coming years? Um, I do see them playing a role, but not a big role. Uh, I don't have numbers by heart of, of estimates, but um, this real will remain um, uh, relatively modest contributions. Um, I think it might be interesting for some fruits, uh, sorry, for some vegetable type of crops, high value crops. Um, I actually, I have a garden myself. Um, well, garden, um, that's a big word for the Netherlands. But um, uh, we grow a couple of crops. Well, I can tell you, I cannot feed myself with it. So all this rooftop stuff and, and all this lightning uh, that comes in will be interesting for some high value crops. People might consider it organic or for some, because the, the nutrient cycles would be closed. But in terms of total volumes, it, it would remain minute. Um, uh, even a, a, a city like um, Singapore would probably still have to import a lot of food. A lot of food, most of our food will still be soil grown. So will it play a role? Maybe in terms of uh, health concerns, maybe in terms of awareness of uh, for people and children. A lot of research is done in the Netherlands uh, of, uh, of the impact of green on cities. For instance, if you have more green in a city, uh, the temperature increase may not be that much. And with climate change it's becoming a problem. So all these cities, because of all the all the asphalt and all the buildings, they heat up. Temperatures in the cities can be several degrees higher than, let's say, uh, outside. So um, if you grow uh, um, uh, crops on your rooftops in the cities, it would also help to reduce the temperature because of the transpiration, etc. So um, I think there might be other reasons and drivers to um, make this thing fly. But will it play a big role in quantitative terms and volume terms? I don't think so. All right. So a few more questions. Um, this one is from Gail. How can soil reclamation be reconciled with current fertilization practices? Oh yeah, uh, I think it must. Um, we, we, we have to. Um, so for instance, on the African continent, we can apply whatever fertilizer we want. If it doesn't come together with soil organic matter, these soils don't have the capacity to hold water or nutrients. Um, so yeah, those things must, must go hand in hand. Um, I think actually everywhere um, um, and it, it must be combined. So that's why we are we are talking about integrated soil fertility management. What I focused on just now in this presentation on innovative fertilizers is um, uh, really to see where we can become can become a little bit smarter, let's say with the sink. Can we get the sink foliarly into into the leaves uh, and into the grains? Because through the soils, it might be a real nightmare. Um, so, but we have to think of combination. That's why I showed one of these last slides um, where it's not just something that comes in foliarly, but it's actually um, a combination of soil applied, foliar, etc. So we will need all that. Yeah, definitely. Ecology, ecology is very complicated. All right, one question from Justin again. Which regions or countries of the world are most receptive to innovative agricultural approaches like those you propose? 
Um, well, I can't speak of the of the US, but I think Europe is very inclined. Um, uh, the Netherlands, for instance, has a huge, um, well, the Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agricultural goods following the United States in, uh, in value terms, in economic terms. Reason is that we have all these greenhouses. Um, um, we have indeed all these um, uh, uh, new and innovative uh, cultivation practices. So I and, and also because of um, uh, the recycling, uh, the, the novel, the innovative economies, etc. So I do see Europe being receptive. Um, if it's uh, the, the African continent, um, I think it depends um, on, on also on the companies, the fertilizer companies who would be willing to kind of uh, stretch their efforts to reach reach out to the continent. Um, but that would be a longer road. Uh, Europe is already ready and prepared for these kind of innovations. Um, African continent would be, um, would be um, I think it would take some more time. But once we could demonstrate that uh, these innovations work, uh, I think it could fly. OK, it looks like uh, no other questions are coming in. Well, in the absence of any other question, um, I would like to say thank you very much to Dr. Prem Bindraban for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Most welcome. All right, so 